Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Richard. That was a uh, that's a great Revelation song, isn't it? And we're in Revelation today again, and um, we're we're in Turkey. And Richard was talking to us about Turkey, so um, and that's where we are today, as we talk about the the seven churches. And um, I trust that you're enjoying. The, uh, the series on the seven churches, and today we're up to church number three. Now I'm going to see if I'm happening. Well, I'll leave that for a sec. We'll see if it's happening in a minute. But, um, but anyhow, thank you for coming. It's great to be here. The weather's changed. It's nice. Hope you're enjoying the weather. And... Um, I trust that you enjoy your time of fellowship and worship with us today. We're just going to pause for prayer briefly. Father, bless your word to us today, I pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. And so as the uh, PowerPoint reminds us, we're, um, we're talking about the church in Pergamon today. But um, before we get there, remember the first church that Richard talked to us about was Ephesus. And um, we need to be reminded that the Lord Jesus said, I know your deeds. And um, he holds the seven stars in his right hand, indicating his power and authority over the church and their leaders. But the thing we need to be reminded of there about the Ephesus church is that they left their first love. So be challenged about that. Be clear about that. The church at Ephesus left their first love and we are encouraged to consider how far have you fallen? But you have this in your favour. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, whom I also hate. And of course that refers to compromising churches. We'll have some more to say about that later. Or compromising Christians. And then last week, Lachlan Margots from uh, Village Ave was here and he spoke to us on the church from Smyrna. And um, the church from Smyrna, the words of the first and the last. And the Lord Jesus said, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. So persecution in those days was, was rife. It was terrible. Lachlan didn't mention it, but um, Polycarp was the bishop of Smyrna. Polycarp was one of the founding church fathers. Polycarp, uh, tradition says, was brought to conversion and a disciple of John who wrote this book that we're reading today. And... Um, I know your afflictions, I know your poverty, yet you are rich. And so he was martyred in about 155 AD. And as Polycarp was being taken into the arena, a voice came to him from heaven and it said, Be strong, Polycarp, and play the man. No one saw who had spoken, but our brothers who were there heard the voice. And when the crowd heard that Polycarp had been captured, there was an uproar. The proconsul asked him whether he was Polycarp. On hearing that he was, he tried to persuade him to apostatize, saying, Have respect for your old age. Swear by the fortune of Caesar. Repent and say, Down with the atheists. Meaning, down with those who don't believe the Roman emperor is God. Reproach Christ and I will set you free. Polycarp looked grimly at the wicked heathen multitude in the stadium and gesturing towards them he said, 86 years have I served him and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my saviour? The words of Polycarp. In 1555, Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley, they were burned at the stake also. And they used the same words as Polycarp. Be of good comfort, Master Ridley. Play the man. 
We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as shall never be put out. There are lots of people in our day and age that are also dying for their faith and being martyred for their faith. More than was being martyred back in those days. We're going to, um, to read now in Revelation chapter 2, reading from verse 12 to 17. Before I get there, I'll go backwards. Right, so just a reminder of um, the churches and where they are. All in, in Turkey, you can see um, Pergamon up the top there. And um, the, uh, the church that we looked at last week was Smyrna. So we're looking um, quite a bit north of Smyrna. We're going to read in Revelation chapter 2 from 12 to 17. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, these are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even, the not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Verse 14, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore. Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Verse 17, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. The city of Pergamum, it was built on a hill a thousand feet above the surrounding countryside, creating a natural fortress. It was a sophisticated city, a centre of Greek culture and education, with a 200,000 volume library. But it was also the centre of four cults and it rivalled Ephesus in its worship of idols, where Satan has his throne. The city's chief god was Asipius, whose symbol was a serpent and who was considered the god of healing. People came from all over the world to seek healing from this god. And I got that information from the NIV Study Bible. And if you have one of those, there's lots of good information there regarding Pergamum. In the passage before us in um, in chapter two, we're reminded that the, that, oh, sorry, I'll just flip over here. We're reminded that this is the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. And um, when we read back in chapter one, that double-edged sword is coming out of the mouth of, um, of the Lord Jesus. And uh, that double-edged sword is, is powerful. And if we read in Hebrews chapter 4, 12 to 13, you'll be reminded, for the word of God is alive and active, and it's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. 
And then as we go on to verse 13, it says there that nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And as we read through these churches, we are reminded that, yes, we are giving an account. The NIV Study Bible reminds us that um, this city is the centre for four idolatrous cults. Zeus, Dionysus, Asepius, and Athene. And Pergamon, according to this scripture, was called the city where Satan has his throne. Where Satan has his throne. Verse 13 reminds us, I know where you live. How, how reassuring that is. God knows, he knows where you live. He knows you and he knows me. I know where you live, yet you remain true to my name. Even though your house is situated right near Satan's throne, I know all about it. I'm there. I'm here to help. That's God's message. I wonder who's on the throne of this city. Ephesians 6.12 reminds us that um, Satan is the, is the prince of the power of the air. Okay, reminds us that um, he influences and does a lot of work in, um, in this um, location. Okay. And even in our city, we can see the work of Satan. And to the people of Ephesus, the Lord said, I know your deeds and I know you can't tolerate uh, wicked people. And to the people of Smyrna, he says, I know your afflictions and your poverty. And to the people of Pergamon, he says, I know where you live. He knows you and he knows me. And nothing is hidden from God. Nothing is hidden from him. And Psalm 139 says, He knows when I sit down, when I stand. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. What a wonderful thought. That's so encouraging. The Lord Jesus has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. But he knows all about us. He knows everything about us and what a wonderful thing that is. Antipas was reputed to be the bishop of the Christian church at Pergamos. And that he was martyred for his faith because of his consistent faithful witness in the face of all the satanic evil present there. He also most likely knew John, the writer of this book. History tells us when Antipas was advised, Antipas, the whole world is against you. He reputedly replied that I'm against the whole world. Antipas was supposedly roasted alive in a hollow life-size bull which had a bonfire under its belly because he refused to renounce his faith in Christ Jesus. We know this for sure, though. He was martyred because of his faithful witness, for his unshakable faith in Christ. And that's what earned Antipas a mention here in the pages of Scripture and a place in God's Hall of Fame. He died about 64 to 68 AD in the reign of Nero. Hmm. It was a difficult time to be a Christian in those days. And the scripture says he was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Verse 14, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. 
There are some among you who will hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. And then, likewise, you have also hold to the teaching, those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise they will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. The, act, the exact origin of the Nicolaitans is unclear. Some Bible commentators believe they were a heretical sect who followed the teachings of Nicholas, whose name means one who conquers the people, who was possibly one of the deacons of the early church mentioned in Acts 6.5. It's possible that Nicholas became an apostate, denying the true faith, and became part of a group holding the doctrine of Balaam who taught Israel to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. Clement of Alexandra says, they abandoned themselves to pleasure, leading a life of self-indulgence. Their teaching perverted grace and replaced liberty with license. And so, if you want to read about the doctrine of Balaam, you go back into Numbers, okay, when the children of Israel were coming from um, Egypt through to the land of Canaan. And the people there were totally, um, the Midianites were totally scared of the uh, Israelites. And so the Midianite king, he hired uh, Balak, who was a sorcerer, to, um, to curse the Israelites. Come and curse these Israelites so that, you know, they won't harm us. And some of you will remember that um, Balaam rode an ass. And um, as Balaam was going to, um, <clears throat> to King Balak, <clears throat> the ass, it wouldn't move. It wouldn't move because it was totally against what God wanted. And the ass could see an angel in his path with a sword drawn, ready to destroy him. And eventually, the ass, it went one way, it went the other way, and then the third time, it just sat down, it wasn't moving. And then the eyes of Balaam were opened and he was able to see. But anyhow, as a result of that, and as a result of money that changed hands, Balaam's um, advice to Balak was, hey, hey, get your girls to go over to, um, to Israel and entice them. And so as a result of that, a lot of sexual immorality and worship of idols ensued. And then with the Nicolaitans, there's a there's a slightly different version of who they were, and that is that they were not called from any man, but from the Greek word nikola, meaning let us eat, as they often encouraged each other to eat things offered to idols. Whichever theory is true, it's certain that the deeds of the Nicolaitans were an abomination to Christ, and they, like other false teachers, abused the doctrine of grace and tried to introduce licentiousness in its place, or the option to do as you please. Romans 6.1, though, reminds us, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? So what Paul is reminding of the Romans is, hey, Grace is not about forgiving you when you just go keep on sinning just for the heck of it and because you think that grace is going to sort it out. How wonderful it is to be able to receive the grace of God and have sins forgiven and live for him. In verse 15 it says, What then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you're slaves of the one you obey? Whether you are slave to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. 
But thanks be to God that though you are used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. And what a wonderful thing that is. And I pray that your opportunity to serve Christ today is one that you and I become slaves to righteousness. And so, just to remind us, okay, God knows. He knows where we live. He knows all about us. He knows my circumstances. He knows my situation. There's nothing about you and I that he doesn't know. And then as we've been thinking about the... Um, the doctrine of Balaam and the Nicolaitans, we are reminded, okay, that they compromised their faith. And for you and I, there needs to be no compromise. Antipas was martyred because of no compromise. Polycarp was martyred because of no compromise. And in this passage of scripture to the people at Pergamum, I have this against you, the Lord says, that you compromise your faith. No compromise. There is room for differences of opinion among Christians in some areas, but there's no room for heresy. There's no room for moral impurity. Our country, our city, the city of Brisbane, it might not participate in idol feasts that I'm aware of, but it bows down to many things. The worship of money, the worship of sex, the worship of material possessions. And there's many things that go with all that. Pornography. Pornography is the beginning of a slippery slope that destroys families and ends up in jail. Men, women, do not go down that path. Do not even begin. You turn your phone on, maybe something comes up. Get rid of it. Put blockers on there. If you have a weakness in that area, do not let it occur. It's the beginning of a slippery slope that will destroy you, will destroy your family, will end up you being in jail. Do not go down that path. If you're listening here today online, let me say it again. Do not go down the path of pornography. It will destroy you. It will destroy your family. And if there's one thing that you can enjoy in your latter years, it's your family. If you go down that path, that slippery slope, that family will be destroyed. You'll wind up with nothing. And ultimately, it leads to jail. There are other things that we compromise on. Stealing, cheating, lying, gossiping, Gay Mardi Gras, two weeks ago in Sydney. It's in your face, on the TV, swindling, legalizing the killing of unborn. And so much rubbish is happening to our young people that they don't know whether they're Jack or Jill. So, <clears throat> the word to us today is don't tolerate sin by bowing to the pressure to be open-minded. The politicians will say to you, be open-minded. People will say, be open-minded. Don't tolerate sin by bowing to that pressure. I wonder, could you be brave enough to stand for Jesus and biblical right at your workplace? Could you be the filter that says, Enough is enough. 
Could you be the person that says when the stories get out of hand, uh, hold it, that's enough. We need to repent of our inaction. There's no place for arrogance and anger, but conversation with gentleness and humility. We come to that um, portion there where it talks about the hidden manner. In verse 17, it says, Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manner. As the Israelites progressed to the promised land, God provided for them with food in the form of manna, which they collected from the ground. Every morning God provided. And God will also provide on our spiritual journey to the promised land also, namely heaven. He will provide the spiritual sustenance that we need for this journey. Manna was a, a wafer-like object made with honey, it says, or tasted like honey. And how sweet it is when we have the bread of life. In John 6.35 it says, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Spiritual food and spiritual drink provided. In Colossians 3 it reminds us that our life is hidden with Christ. That's a good place to be. A life hidden with Christ. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. That's a great place. For when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator mm. lastly we come to that portion and it talks about the white stone there are lots of theories regarding the white stone. But the best theory that I read regarding the meaning of the white stone probably has to do with the ancient Roman custom of awarding white stones to the victors of athletic games. The winner of a contest was awarded a white stone with his name inscribed on it. And this served as his ticket to a special awards banquet. And so that would kind of indicate that these stones are the evidence that a person has been accepted by God and declared worthy to receive eternal life. And according to this view, Jesus promises the overcomer's entrance to the eternal victory celebration in heaven. The new name most likely refers to the Holy Spirit's work of conforming believers to the holiness of Christ. My mind, when I was reading this passage, you know, it went to many places in Scripture where it talks about the book of life and whether or not your name is written there. Over the page in, in Revelation 3.5, it, um, it talks about 
the one who is victorious will like them be dressed in white and I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life but will acknowledge that name before my father and his angels. Our name, it needs to be written in heaven. Our name needs to be written on that white stone. Our name needs to be written in the book of life. In Revelation 20, it says, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recording, recorded in the books. This is referring to the great white throne judgment. But whether you believe that you don't <clears throat> appear before this judgment, you are going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And again, the books will be opened. Everything is recorded. That's hard to imagine, isn't it? It's recorded. We were having a big discussion at home the other night about rewards and how we should live our Christian life. Do we live for rewards or don't we live for rewards? Do we just live our life for the Lord and let the rewards happen? You know, there's lots of discussion that you can have, but one thing is to be sure, there's rewards. And whether you believe it or not, that won't change a thing because there is rewards, the scripture tells us. The Bible says the sea gave up the dead that were in it and the death and hell gave up the dead that were in them. Each person was judged according to what they had done, what was written in the book. But the important thing for you and I is to have our name written in the book of life. Can you confidently say that my name is in there? That your name is there? Can you say that? It's so important. As young people, we used to sing a song, there's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. And the white-robed angels tell the story, a sinner has come home. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven, never more to roam. I pray that that's your testimony today, that your name is written in heaven. If you're not sure that your name is written in heaven, come and see me. Talk to Richard, talk to Barry, talk to Albert, talk to Jim, talk to men that you know and women that you know who are on their way to heaven and have their name written there. What a wonderful thing it would be to enter into the presence of the Lord to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. What a wonderful thing that would be. Is your name there? There are three things that I want you to remember about this message today. The first thing is that he knows. He knows your situation. He knows where you live. He knows everything about you, whether you're going through a tough time or an easy time. He knows. Remember that. Remember, no compromise. You be a Christian person in your community, in your family, in your work, where there is no compromise. Stand tall. Be a light for Jesus. And lastly, is your name there? Get that sorted. Make sure you can confidently say that my name is written in heaven. Let's just pray and then we'll have some fellowship together over a cup of tea. So um, remember those three things. He knows no compromise is your name there. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, we come to you today in the name of the Lord Jesus. And here we are, and we know that you know. Nothing is hidden from you. You know, Father, that we're in Satan's domain. But you, Lord, are all-powerful. I pray that you would protect us. I pray that you would keep us. Keep us from sin, I pray. Keep us from the slippery slide of, of going into those paths that just wind up away from you. Protect us, Father, I pray. Help us to be aware of our own weaknesses for your glory, I pray. Lord Jesus, you are all powerful, and we thank you for that. Lord, we repent and are sorry for the compromises that we have made regarding our faith. And Lord, help us to be lights for you. Help us to have the courage and the boldness to stand for you in our workplaces, in our families, in, in our communities, that we might be people that honour you and give glory to you, whatever the outcome for your glory, I pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you for coming. Please join with us now for a cup of tea. Thank you, Richard. Yeah.